good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Rob Stoneman. I'm a, a rewilding area coordinator at Rewilding Europe, which is a Dutch based charity that I work from home here in York. Uh, and the background behind me is not York, but it's a beautiful part of the, uh, the Highlands in Scotland. So I was wandering around a few months ago. Um, I've been involved in the, uh, the Asia and UK peatland programme since its beginning, helped set the programme up. We've chaired it for quite a long time, so I'm sure many of you watching may have known me before. But I'm delighted to uh, think about peatlands and continue our look at peatlands from a global perspective. And uh, we've got four great speakers uh, today. So we've got Hans Hewson, um, who some of us will know from Scotland, where he worked with SIPA, but he now works at Wetlands International, he's their European peatland lead. He's going to be talking about the many benefits of peatland from a global perspective. Uh, we're then going to move into Southeast Asia and we have Faisal Parrish, uh, who's the director of the Global Environment Centre, uh, which is a, a charity based in Malaysia. And he's going to give us an update of what's going on in Southeast Asia's fascinating peatlands, uh, just one of the most fantastic areas of the world. Uh, sadly, heavily degraded, but things might be improving. Uh, we're then going to get a, a, a a look across the European peatlands uh, with Franziska Tanneberger, who's from the Greifswald Meyer Centre. She's based at the University of Greifswald. That university in itself sits in a fantastic peatland environment uh, on the Pina River and out into Poland around the uh, around the Schetzen Lagoon. Absolutely superb area. And he's, she's going to talk to us about the state condition of peatlands in Europe. And then we're going to finish off with uh, Neil Brocklin from the National University of Ireland in Galway. Another fantastic uh, peatland landscape, quintessential black bog landscape. And he's going to talk to us about a review of peatland policies uh, across Europe. So without further ado, let's uh, let's move to uh, Hans, please. Good morning, good afternoon, or good, good evening, wherever you are. I'm Hans Hutton. I'm the programme head, Climate Ready Land Use for Wetlands International. And it is a strange thing at this moment in time talking to you from our own rooms. Um, I think actually I'll come back on, on that later, but I miss the, the interaction with people within their conference and being able to talk to you. So on the last slide, you'll see my contact details and our contact details from Wetlands International. And please get in contact with you, with us. If you want to talk further about this subject or if you've got ideas or if you want to work with us, because only together we can work and we can deliver peatlands and peatlands for people. And I think that's really important and that's really a passion of mine. So let's dive into this. I've been asked to talk about balancing the benefits of peatlands and I've added a subtitle, a landscape approach. So let's start with something, something different, something where we haven't been before. Red Square, Moscow, 2010. Thick smog covering the, um, the Red Square, 50,000 excess deaths. What was going on there? Thick acrid smoke filling it, um, people having the respiratory problems. If we look into that, and what, when, when we see that, we say that the reason for that is that outside Moscow, there was a whole range of peatlands that were caught fire. Why did these peatlands catch fire? Because they were drained. And the drained peatlands combined with the land use created such a, an issue and such a risk of of, of, um, of them catching fire and being, being able, not being able to control the fires that, that resulted in these big fires, lots of smoke, the smoke drifted in Ros and into Moscow and created big problems. And I know as the world, we're in the middle of COVID and we're at the end of the COVID um, pandemic and we've got big problems as a world. So one of the, one of the, uh, the functions and one of the reasons for peatlands and one of the reasons for better managing peatlands is to reduce um, disaster risk. Whether or not it's flood or whether or not it is fire, it's happening all over the world. Another thing I'd like to talk about when we talk about humans and human health and functions of, of wetlands and peatlands in particular for people is health and, and health and well-being. Um, it's an interesting story, but um, Bog myrtle, which is a small shrub grown on natural peatlands in um, in Scotland, is turned around and for ages have been turned to, in, around in a very effective midge repellent. The, inter the interesting story is that that midge repellent is being used by the elite forces of the of the navy and the elite forces of the army in the UK to actually combat that midge. And it's not a big stinging midge that's on the picture. 
it's um, a, a stinging mosquito is here in, on the picture, but there's a tiny, tiny midge that by the thousands and the hundreds of thousands crawl on your hair and under your skin, over, or under your hair and, and under your skin and just really drive you mad. So I can really understand why even the, uh, the, the, uh, the toughest of soldiers need it, because I did need it. Uh, believe me, when I was out doing field work up in Scotland, they are really, really annoying. So we've had human health and disaster risk reduction as two important areas why wetlands are really important, why peatlands are really important, and why we need to think about a, a joint way of managing them and how we do that. A third one that is really coming to the fore, and a lot of these uh, the issues today during the, um, during the whole IUCN conference, but also further afield that are being talked about is carbon and carbon sequestration and storage. Peatlands, and as um, Hans Joosten from Greifswald Meyer Centre already very clearly said in a, in a recent conference that I attended, peatlands are in incredibly important for carbon and for carbon storage because the degraded, um, um, the partially degraded plant biomass is, and the carbon is all stored and is not being released to the environment when it stays when it stays wet. However, it can be released to the environment when it's drying out, either as, as uh, through the, um, the the water flows or directly into the atmosphere. Yeah, the although the peatlands only cover um, three percent of the world's earth surface they store more than twice the amount of carbon in all the forests. So it is a really important um, store of carbon. And not only a store of carbon, but in the right management, and especially in some of the, the more temperate peatlands and some of the other peatlands, it's, it's a really good way of sequestering carbon and in this, uh, taking carbon from the atmosphere and turning it into stored up carbon and just re reducing the quantity. So it's not only important for um, 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 mitigation, but it's also really important to reduce the, um, the carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. So how do we know that? And that's what the picture is here all about. It's, we do a lot of, um, there's a lot of signs around on how to measure the amount of, of carbon within the, the system. So we've had disaster risk reduction with the fires and the floods. We've had health reasons with the Mitch repellent and there's a whole series of other examples. And now we are talking about carbon and carbon sequestration, which is really important. Interestingly enough as well, the whole carbon sequestration is becoming, over the last 10, 15 years, becoming more and more important in terms of a finance source to drive this forward. Because carbon credits and especially the carbon market is becoming a very important finance source, not only during the initial stages of peatland restoration, but also later on as a as a longer term payment to the people that manage those lands or that own those lands and manage it to either maintain the carbon, reduce the emissions and increase the storage. The next thing that I'll talk about in terms of a function that peatlands fulfill for people is is um, food and, and um, food and, and, and shelter. On the left of your slide, you see a picture of a um, of a farmer up in Indonesia um, taking away poor and grass and turning that into into um, 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 in, yeah into um, furniture, into baskets, and they're being used all over the place. So a sustainable way of managing peatlands at his high water tables. So you see the person there up to up to her waist or up to his waist in in water. So wet peatlands in combination where you can have a, a healthy peatland, a storage of carbon and a commercial crop. On the right, just above my head on your, on your slide, you see salad crops in East Anglia, the other side of the world, whereby the, the growing of salad, the, the salad crops is integrated in, in, with high water tables. So on one side, we maintain the carbon on the, and on the other side, we pro provide a sustainable livelihood for people. There's a whole of range of, there's over a thousand species of plants that have been identified as potential uh, polluticulture crops. And Greifswald Meyer Center has got a really good database on that. And it would be great to start building on that as people community and restoration community. So we marry not only the, um, the, the, the risk side of things, the risk reduction side of peatlands, not only the carbon storage, not only the health aspects, but root that 
in good and sustainable local livelihoods, which are prosperous, because in the end of the day, it's the people that drive forward this and the people that have been managing these landscapes for centuries. Well, let's now talk to the last area of, of wetlands that are of peatlands and the function for, for people that I want to talk about, and that's flow regulation and water quality. That's all around water. And that is really important. The slides that you see here, and that's one from the the SCAM project in, in the UK, whereby the water company, together with uh, the nature conservation people and the environment protection people, started thinking about, OK, we've got an issue. And you see on the, re on the right end of the slide, we got an issue of degraded peatlands, losing carbon, but also deep gullies and losing their water very quickly. You can see a grassed over peatland. So the, the quality is going down, the water is lost quickly, and the carbon is lost. When they started blocking up the ditches, which they did together, you can see the peat getting wetter, where there is much more water being stored and the peatland started, the vegetation started to improve. And on the right hand side of the slide, you see actually that the peatland is and the, um, and the um, the cotton grass is recovering, the sphagnum mosses are back, so the carbon is being stored and, and sequestered and is not released back into the atmosphere again. You can see the stellar carbon being sequestered with the sphagnum. The cotton grass is growing and the water is maintained and stored within the sphagnum. So on one side, by by restoring the upland peatlands in an area of the UK, but also in other areas, we've got a reduced and, and we got the water being kept longer within the peatlands itself. So you've got less flooding downstream, but also you got more water during drought and, and low flow situations because the water is kept back. So you've got a more gradual um, 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 discharge of water, which is better for the drinking water abstractions further downstream and for the human health, less flooding and because of the um, the, the, the land is not eroding anymore and the function that the peatlands fulfill and that the plants fulfill, the amount of, um, of, of, of um, dissolved organic carbon but also nitrates um, that could come through it are being reduced because of the, of the function that the plants fulfill. So you've got better water quality, you've got a lo lower flow peaks and flood peaks and you've got a, an improved amount of water available during low flow situations and during drought. That's being used not only in the UK, not only in Europe, but much wider of food. And there's a really good marry between flow regulation and water quality. So let's speed up a little bit because I see already on 10 minutes, I've only got 15 minutes for this talk. So the benefits of peatland we just high highlighted were disaster risk reduction, the human health, the carbon store and sequestration, prosperous livelihoods, in terms of the, the food and the commercial crops that can be grown and water flow regulation and water quality. So that's what the functions are, but how do we move that forward? And that's really what you want me to talk about. So how do we do that in a landscape? So the only way to do that from our perspective and our experience is to do that in a landscape. You see an amazing valley and what you see here is a meandering river and the meandering, the meandering river um, is because of the meandering river and all the peatlands around it, you've got your water storage. Within those rivers and within the lakes, but also within the peatlands, we've got the availability of growing the crops and um, the high water tables will reduce the, the risk of fires and the, and the, and, and the, um, the water stored will reduce the risk of um, flooding further downstream. So at a landscape scale, we can identify areas and zones whereby a certain certain function of the peatlands is optimized. And I think that's what is really important. That's what we find when we look at the work that we do in Indonesia, in Russia, in Latin America, and in Africa, and also in Europe. Now, what is important is to zone it, and to zone it appropriately, whereby the best areas for biodiversity Will be, will be focused on biodiversity. I and mean, there is really good important reasons for that, but it's also good for, for recreation. Those areas with a high, with a high opportunity for carbon, focused on carbon or on food production, food is appropriate, focused on food production. But underlining it, it's really important because very often all these functions can happen together. So high water tables maintain the carbon 
and provide flood storage and provide water for during drought and provide space for people can grow grow things so what we're really saying is there is space for all for all these opportunities within the landscape and by zoning it and by creating opportunities for the, those functions to happen in mosaics within the landscape that's the way best way forward so there is the best way to that is mapping opportunities and returns we need to know where are the best opportunities and returns from a social economic and environmental perspective that's been done and has been done quite a bit and we can really build on that and then on the back of that we need to maximize those opportunities where there are benefits for more than one opportunity and minimize the loss but starting off and that's why my picture has got people in there on the on the bottom on to the right is what is really important and what we found is this will only happen and this will only work long term if we bring people along with us because the people that manage the landscape the people that farm the people that farm carbon the people that look after the water and the people that look after the crops they need to be involved from the beginning so there is an ownership and a shared understanding where we want to move to so let's wrap this up that we feel that for all these functions that we looked at we can we can do that if we look at the landscape scale whereby there is place for all place for social economic and environmental success and we can do that only if we can do that together so what i hope that i've shown over the over the last in the last 15 minutes that there is a real good space to do all these things together it is important that we can have all these functions together in one peatland and we can do it so please get in contact with us either through wetlands.org or through my own uh, my own email within wetlands and i wish you all a really good conference the rest of the day thank you for your attention good afternoon my name is faisal parish i'm the director of the global environment center based in malaysia and I'm going to be talking to you about peatland action in Southeast Asia. This presentation prepared with my colleagues, uh, Liu Siu Lan, uh, with uh, support under the uh, ASEAN uh, Measuring Action, uh, Measurable Action for Haze Free Southeast Asia program. And in the presentation, which I don't, okay. Uh, so I'm, just touch, I'm going to be talking about peatlands in Southeast Asia. We have 23 million hectares of peatlands in the region, um, mainly in the southern portion of the region in Indonesia and Malaysia, but all ASEAN uh, member states, the 10 ASEAN member states have some peatlands and we're discovering more year by year. So peatlands in Southeast Asia have a high biodiversity, maybe slightly different to that in the UK. I don't know how many uh, Malayan sun bears you see running around, maybe some Paddington bears instead. So uh, we have a high diversity. On the top right is endemic uh, emerald uh, fighting fish, uh, endemic fish, just a uh, single site endemic in Malaysia. Uh, and we're finding many peatlands have single site endemic fish species. So this particular site has six uh, newly described species to science described in the last 20, 30 years. So very high di diversity of plants and animals in the peatlands. So the peatlands in the ASEAN or Southeast Asian region play a key role in the regulation of climate. And they're also critical for water storage and flood prevention. Peatlands in the region uh, can be up to 25 meters thick and uh, one single peatland uh, dome or hydrological unit can cover up to uh, nearly a million hectares. So they can be massive stores of water and play a key, key role in uh, preventing flood and uh, supporting dry season water supply. Peatlands in the region are also key for feeding community, particularly marginal and the poor communities that live in and around a peatland area which depend on them for livelihood. They also support the uh, community uh, and larger scale enterprises. This, as you may know, is the chewing gum tree or gelatong. On the right, maybe you can see, maybe this is the largest blocks of chewing gum you've seen. This is the world's best chewing gum, comes from the tree, but maybe what you have in the UK is a synthetic variety rather than the natural one. So in Southeast Asia, we have extensive peatlands, but we have major management issues. Started off early, maybe 30, 40 years ago, over exploitation, logging of the forest resources, since our peatlands are naturally forested. 
We also have large scale agriculture, oil palm and forest plantation development in the peatlands, uh, which have expanded rapidly and led to significant degradation. There's also peatland over drainage and subsidence, extensive peatland fires and associated haze, fragmentation and disruption of the peatland landscapes, loss of peatland biodiversity and greenhouse gas emission and climate vulnerability. I'll go into a little illustrate a few things. In the last uh, 10, 15 years, we've had more than 5 million hectares of peatlands in the region have burnt. And this is one of the major sources of greenhouse gas emissions in the region. Uh, when peatlands burn, they generate vast amount of smoke. Uh, and unfortunately, roughly 70% of those 23 million hectares of peatlands have been degraded over the last 40 years. Some severely degraded like this, others have just been drained or logged or cleared. And when peatlands burn, they're generating vast amount of smoke. And you can see the transboundary smoke moving from uh, Sumatra in the uh, bottom left of the image to Malaysia in the top right. And my house is somewhere in the middle of that smoke cloud. This is the biggest, uh, most serious uh, peatland fire event that we had. This is uh, image is in October uh, 1997, when the smoke cloud covered approximately 10 million square kilometers. It uh, covered uh, five countries in Southeast Asia, and the tail drifted across to southern India, Sri Lanka, and even into a East Africa. So this was the largest single emission pulse of carbon dioxide globally that has been recorded, but also its major impact on the health uh, and uh, economy as well as environment within the region. Unfortunately, these fires have frequently occurred during uh, drought periods recurrent over the last 20, 25 years. So 90% of the transboundary haze or smoke haze in South, Southern Asian region is coming from peatland fires. And uh, these are recognized as the largest single environment challenge in Southeast Asia. So Starting after the massive uh, fires and the smoke I showed 97, 98, El Nino, the governments of the 10 Southeast Asian countries under the framework of ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, created a number of frameworks to address uh, the transboundary haze. Firstly, the ASEAN Agreement on Transboundary Haze Pollution, which was signed in 2002. But very quickly, they recognized that the core of the fire and the transboundary haze were peatlands and therefore the following year ASEAN Peatland Management Initiative was initiated, which was a partnership between the ASEAN member states uh, and my organization Global Environment Center. And this evolved later to generate what is called the ASEAN Peatland Management Strategy 2006 to 2020, which is an extensive roadmap uh, agreed by all of the 10 ASEAN member states to map out what exactly needed to be done to bring peatlands back more into a sustainable management approach and stop this extensive uh, fire and transboundary haze. And linked to that was a program 2014 to 2020 as in program on sustainable management of peatland ecosystems. I don't have much time, but I'll just give a few snapshots of some of the progress that has been made on some of these issues. So just take that as in peatland management strategy adopted in 2006, run up to 2020, we have just completed the final review of that uh, strategy. And what you can see here is just a snapshot out of the extracted from the final review report, which was adopted last week by the 10 uh, member states. And you can see of the 97 actions which were proposed in 13 focal areas in 2006, 100% of the actions specified have been started by the countries and 99% are still ongoing in some form. Um, the geographic scope, uh, that column there, uh, average of seven, this is the number of member states, number of countries who are implementing the various actions in the action strategy as uh, spelled out. And the last column is an indicator of the relative progress, the progress score that has been made in addressing those actions. So over, overall, nearly 70% completion of the actions or very significant progress. So a lot has been done, uh, started stimulated by a major problem, but very significant progress has been made. That's not to say everything is solved. There are ongoing challenges. 
And it's not only been the government acting, there are also other stakeholders who've been stimulated uh, to take action, as well as the main action itself is taken at the country level. I'll just give a quick example of Indonesia. Indonesia has 20 million hectares of peatlands. These peatlands occur within 850 different peatland hydrological units. Those units cover 24 million hectares with the peat and the surrounding mineral soil to the uh, nearby rivers or, or the sea. And those have been mapped out, all mapped out and identified, and they have been divided into conservation utilization zone, roughly on a 50-50 basis, uh, according to various criteria. A target was set in 2016 for rewetting and preventing fire in 2.6 million hectares of degraded peatlands by 2020, extremely ambitious, rewetting or raising water table in both production areas and uh, conservation areas. But fantastic achievement by Indonesia. Um, by this year, 2020, they have reached a target of 3.2 million hectares with enhanced water management in concession areas, areas under management of private sector. Uh, 300,000 hectare has been restored through natural vegetation in the concession and quite a lot more beyond. And then 10,000 hectares have been restored by local community. So just a little bit more detail, I don't have time to go into, but you can look at the slides later. This just gives the breakdown by province of the areas, the areas set aside for conservation versus cultivation uh, in the different regions. Uh, this is also uh, very significant, uh, spells out some of the key uh, actions put in place, particularly in that plantation landscape. So in industrial forest plantation and in oil palm plantations, uh, as I mentioned, more than 3.2 million hectares has enhanced water management. So previously, the average water table was sitting maybe about uh, 60 to 80 centimeter below the surface. And that's been brought up to about 40 to 50 centimeters under new regulation, which has reduced the risk of fire and the degradation. In order to track that, an incredible, probably the largest in the world, groundwater level, peatland water level monitoring system have been set up across the country to uh, track that. And you can just see just a quick uh, scattering where this is. So 10,224 groundwater level monitoring units have been established right across the country in all key regions with the peatlands as mapped out here, of which a thousand are automatic data loggers, which directly transmit their data and the 9,000 are manual data. And that information goes straight to a central uh, control point at the ministry and the ministry at the touch of a button can see the current uh, water level in the different parts of the peatlands throughout the country. Here's just one uh, particular area. You can see the network of the blue circles, which are the, the manual uh, water level monitoring and the red data loggers, which are transmitting information. And also the, the little uh, red squares, which are the, the blocks which have been installed in the uh, drainage uh, canals to raise the water level in the peatland landscape to ensure that it meets the regulated requirement of no more than 40 centimeter below the surface. In addition, quite of these measurement systems have been put into conservation areas and other rehabilitated uh, landscape. But I think this is probably one of the world's largest uh, peatland water level monitoring systems, which has been critical at reducing very significantly the amount of uh, fires and degradation in these peatland uh, levels. Even though there have been extensive fires in Indonesia as most recently as 2019, there have been almost no fires in the areas where these uh, water management uh, and monitoring systems have been established. Another important uh, partner in this has been the private sector, in particular the uh, oil palm sector, which was blamed as a major contributor to the problem of peatland degradation, and that uh, through the roundtable on sustainable palm oil has taken uh, major measures uh, to uh, uh, address uh, the degradation of peatlands and come out with the best management practice manuals. Also some key policies. After 2018, RSPO does not allow its members to have any new plantings of peat or peatlands which are not developed must be managed for conservation. And then there's a process of phasing out of peatlands uh, over the coming period based on subsidence uh, and uh, the depth of peat. 
So the, a lot of effort in the rehabilitation. Um, you can just see one example. This is a degraded peatland in a concession of oil palm company in 2016. All we did was raise the water level, stop fire, and within two years, you can see the forest has recovered to about four to five meters tall. This is exactly the same point. Um, we are also exploring various paludiculture crops from sago, melaleuca, elipe, and the gelatong tree as indigenous species that can grow in wet or rewetted peatlands. Just finally, an example from Malaysia, North Selangor Peat Swamp Forest covers 80,000 uh, hectares, uh, 50 kilometers from Kuala Lumpur. Large portions circled in red were degraded, burnt from, from logging and agricultural exploitation. It's the largest contiguous peat swamp forest remaining in peninsula Malaysia, very significant for water supply to adjacent rice fields. Um, 600 kilometers of logging canals in there. We've started a program of ecological restoration, basically blocking the canals, raising water levels, stopping fires and encouraging the natural forest vegetation to come back in. We've also linked up communities living around the boundary, created an active community-based peatland management program in, involving villages from uh, four villages operating the last eight years. 95% reduction in fires within this landscape and this model of community-based peatland protection has now been promoted to other areas. To ensure sustainability, we tie in both the work of protecting and rehabilitating the peat together with community livelihoods such as handicraft, ecotourism, fishery, or other sustainable livelihood. So I hope that gives you a little snapshot of uh, what are the initiatives that we're taking uh, within the peatlands in the region and hope some of this can be inspiration uh, for the program in uh, Europe and in the UK. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Franziska Tanneberger, and I will talk about peatlands in Europe, the beautiful continent we live in together, about their state and condition. Europe has only 0.6 million square kilometers of the world's around 4.5 million square kilometers of peatland. But Europe has also a long history of peatland studies and peatland use. In the background, you see the, to our knowledge, first known painting of a natural mire in Europe by Albrecht Dürer in 1495. Large scale wetland drainage started in Greece already some 3,500 years ago. The first scientific book on peatlands and peat extraction was published in the Netherlands in 1658. Peatland drainage and so-called thermatology was taught at universities in Russia already in the late 19th century. So there is a lot of knowledge on the peats on the continent's peatlands. There's a long list of major works on European peatlands. Uh, starting with the very early works by von Bülow in 1929, uh, Katz, Turemnov, or Moore and Bellamy. Um, I would also like to mention some of the key contributors from the UK, like Roger Goodwilly, later Olivia Breck and Richard Lindsay, and Richard Lindsay in particular. In 1990, the International Maya Conservation Group in, I think it was in Dublin, uh, took a decision to bring together an overview of European peatlands. And this happened actually some 27 years later in 2017, when uh, a book was published, the European Myers book, as we call it, you can also see it here. It's a very heavy book. Um, it contains 49 so-called country chapters about uh, separate countries or regions in Europe. It was compiled by 135, 34 national authors from all the different countries. And it has uh, around 800 pages and three kilograms of weight. And what is also important, it took a biogeographic approach. So the European continent is seen uh, in its totality as the continent. Um, so it is uh, covering an area um, to the east, to the Ural Mountains. Um, the book also includes um, the Caucasus, um, also Turkey. Um, and um, it was uh, a major and joint effort of the International Maya Conservation Group and uh, coordinated by the Greifswald Meyer Center and with strong contribution by um, NTNU and uh, Trondheim University Museum. 
in person of uh, Aspion Moon. One of the um, co-products um, of this book, uh, Endeavour, was uh, a new peatland map of Europe, a map you can see here in, in this slide. And this was published separately in Myers and Pete and is also made available um, as a geotiff uh, freely to everybody who wants to use it. And by compiling this map, we took a um, bottom up approach. So we really combined all the national and regional data sets, um, harmonized them as uh, far as possible. And the entire map is based on the IPCC uh, 2013 wetland supplement definition of organic soil itself based on the FAO criteria for histosols. So we did not use a minimum thickness requirement for the organic layer. And this uh, also um, deviates and varies very strongly between countries. By bringing together this map into separate data sets, um, we um, ended up with an area of or almost 600,000 uh, square kilometers of peat soils or organic soils uh, in Europe and including the shallow peatlands of European Russia, it is more than 1 million square kilometers on the European continent. Now looking at the smaller map first, um, in green we see the peatland area in percentage of the total country area for various countries and there is of course a clear um, uh, difference between Northern Europe, where we have uh, peatland coverage of um, more than 10% or even more than 20% in some countries, and Southern Europe, where peatlands are less uh, common. On average, it is 4% um, of the European area. When looking now at the status of the peatlands, um, the larger map in red colors, um, this gives you the degraded peatland area in percentage of the total peatland area of a country. And here the picture is a bit different. We have far more degradation in Southern Europe. Um, there are a few countries uh, really sticking out like Germany where more than 95% of the peatland area is degraded. Um, but also other countries like Portugal, for example, um, is important here. And you see that, for example, in Scandinavia, there is a smaller percentage of peatlands degraded, uh, but still it's a phenomenon um, across the continent. And more than half of the peatland area is actually degraded. And degraded means usually uh, drained artificially. When bringing together all the knowledge from all these peatland scientists, peatland practitioners in all the European countries, Asbjörn Moon led also um, an analysis of Maya regions for Europe um, based on a variety of uh, climatic factors on, on vegetation. And he arrived at 10 Maya regions and 52 subregions in Europe. And um, you can find this map in, in the book. And I would like just like to use the opportunity now to walk you through the 10 zones uh, with a few pictures to give you an impression of the richness and uh, variety of uh, Myers in Europe. Starting in the south, um, we have the Arctic Sea Patch and Polygon Maya region. So you may want to be surprised that we have Polygon uh, Myers in Europe. Yes, we do. In the far north, uh, this is a picture from uh, Spitsbergen. Uh, of course, it's a rather small area and more to the south, um, there is the Palsa Maya region, um, another type of, of Mayas um, formed and influenced strongly by, by frost and um, uh, freezing and melting. Here you see a small Palsa in Norway in the foreground. And then moving further from north to south, we have the northern Fen region. Here a picture from Finland a larger area covering Iceland, uh, large parts of northern Scandinavia and northern European Russia. And to the south we come to the typical raised bog region. Here a picture from Lithuania, you have the Baltic countries here, southern Sweden, um, uh, European Russia again, and um, then also parts in, in France, for example, and uh, in the Alpine region. More to the uh, North Sea, we have the Atlantic Bog region, and this is most relevant for the United Kingdom. 
It covers large parts um, of Scotland, Wales and England, of Ireland, um, but also along the coast, um, the Spanish-Portugal coast, the Fr French coast, and uh, in the Netherlands, um, Denmark, and uh, large parts also of the Norwegian coast. We have then the continental Fen and Bog region, more to the east. Um, here a picture from uh, Belarus, uh, also covering parts of Ukraine, of Russia. And a Nemoral submeridional Fen region, uh, which is then uh, again more to the south, covering many countries in Europe and uh, also parts of England. And this is a picture actually uh, from the UK and a very uh, well-known uh, Fen, I think, to many of you. And a very small Maya region is the Kolches Maya region, where we have a very particular type of percolation box, unique for Europe. It's a tiny area, you can hardly see it on the map, and it's uh, located in Georgia. And we have a Southern European marsh region, uh, where we describe, summarize um, a lot of smaller Maya types in uh, Southern Europe also often coastal types, and uh, a central and southern European mountain region uh, of higher altitude. On the map you see that it covers the mountain ranges, and uh, then also again um, interesting uh, types of Myers, um, also do, um, influenced by the high altitude, by the low temperatures, um, and uh, this is a picture from Azerbaijan, for example, so-called Bugri Myers. Then bringing together the um, knowledge in this book, we also collected um, insights and lessons learned from the dialogue um, with the peatland scientists. All over Europe, peatlands have received much less attention of politics and society than forests. Peatlands are generally overlooked, have a bad connotation, are considered as too small, too complex, or too specialistic to bother about. In Europe, Hardly any Myers have survived in areas with climatic and adaptive suitability for arable agriculture. In countries with long-term peatland drainage, the losses have been so severe that in the majority of the former peatlands, all the peat has been removed or oxidized. For example, in the Netherlands, peatlands once covered more than 50% of the land area. It's indicated on the left part of, of the slide and now it is only 7%. Peatland destruction is mostly not a sneaking process, but the result of concerted and large-scale action. Often taking place very fast, for example in Iceland, where over a period of about 50 years, more than 31,600 kilometers of ditches were dug. Enormous areas of peatlands have been drained as part of youth campaigns, unemployment relief works, and works of prisoners. These rapid developments were initially stimulated by the good results in terms of land productivity. Setbacks like soil degradation and subsidence only became apparent decades later. Much of the damage is irreversible. In peatland-rich countries, the idea of an unlimited resource has hampered conservation and wise use strategies. Formerly bog-rich countries have not managed to save one complete bog massive from drainage. Drained peatlands are difficult and expensive to restore. Of the 0.38 million square kilometers in Europe, less than 1% has been revetted so far. More than 100 million euros spent by the Netherlands on bog restoration have resulted only until now in four hectares of good bog vegetation. The problem of greenhouse gas emissions from drained peatlands is still pressing. The European Union is, after Indonesia, the second largest emitter globally. You can see the two emission hotspots from peatlands uh, indicated in this map. When we launched the book at an UNFCCC side event in May 2017 in Bonn, we handed it over to the head of delegation for Indonesia, Nur Masripatin. You see the very um, small, strong women next to Hans Joosten in this slide. <clears throat> and what, what we actually said, um, that if the South can learn anything from the North, 
it is how not to do things with regard to peatlands. But exactly the greenhouse gas emissions are perhaps now finally the release for a new relationship of humans and peatlands, because this issue is really pressing and urgent. The total emissions from drained peatlands in the European Union are 220 megatons of CO2 equivalents per year. This is around 5% of EU greenhouse gas emissions. It's even worse when looking at agriculture, combining direct emissions and low CF emissions related to agriculture. The map indicates countries um, with greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture on peatlands and their megatons per year. So we have countries Germany, Poland, Romania, and the UK, for example, with more than 20 megatons of CO2 equivalents per year from agriculturally used peat soils. In total, 142 megatons in the European Union. In many countries, it's more than 50% of the total emissions attributed to agriculture. And in other words, revetting just a small proportion of the agricultural land indicated in the inner circle will reduce agricultural greenhouse gas emissions by up to a very larger proportion, like 25% on the outer circle for the European Union. <clears throat> And we know a lot already, peatland conservation implies primarily the conservation of its hydrology. If you want to conserve a peatland, you have to conserve its entire peat body and in case of groundwater fed systems, its mineral catchment area. Conservation is much more cost effective than restoration. Revetting stops subsidence and substantially reduces greenhouse gas emissions as well as nutrient release. And last but not least, if you have to use peatlands, use them wet. At the end of my presentation, I would like to thank all co-authors and supporters of the European Myers book, all their names presented on this slide. And I would like to thank you for listening and I'm looking forward to discussing with you. Thank you very much. Hello there, my name is Neil Obrilicon and I'm delighted to be invited to talk to you here today at the IUCN conference and the subject of my talk is a review of peatland policies across Europe. I'm with the National University of Ireland in Galway and I'm with the Data Science Institute and I'm also involved, I'm the policy leader of um, the Care Peat Interreg project which involves uh, nine partners from across five different co European countries, Ireland, the UK, uh, France, the Netherlands and Belgium. So we're working together to uh, discuss many different aspects of peatland policy and indeed to do practical rewetting of peatlands in those five countries. Now today's talk is has got really um, three key areas to discuss. Uh, the first one is an overview of global and EU peatland policies including financial support mechanisms so we'll be talking about things like carbon credits for example. Uh, the second one I want to update you, because I am from Ireland, I want to update you on Ireland's uh, peatland activity. Um, and the third one is to talk about work underway to assess uh, key policy gaps. And that's in relation to both Ireland, the UK, and indeed uh, in, in a more European context. And really the focus of those policy gaps is to do with, I suppose, carbon reduction and the re-wetting of peatlands and the restoration of peatlands from a biodiversity point of view as well. Okay, the main purpose of today's talk is to give you an overview of global and EU peatland policies, including financial support mechanisms. My background in um, the Irish Parliament, I was a member of the Irish Parliament and currently a researcher in the National University of Ireland, Galway, um, gives me great interest in terms of uh, discussing the possibilities of saving greenhouse gas emissions from peatlands. But re-wetting bogs can in fact save up to 5% of global carbon emissions, which is extraordinary, and it can play a key role in saving our planet. So it is important. Many people in this conference will be aware, but probably a lot of people outside of here will not be aware that roughly 33% of all soil carbons are stored in peatlands, not in any other type of ecosystem. 
and that they cover roughly only 3% of the global land area. So they're hugely important. But unfortunately, degraded peatlands are providing about 5% of global carbon emissions, which is a huge amount. Rewetting, thankfully, can help to reduce this enormously. And to put it in context, you hear a lot of talk about aviation and shipping, but not much talk about uh, the contribution of peatlands, but it, it's greater than, than both of those actually put together. In fact, um, up to, you know, peatlands hold up to four times as much um, carbon as a hectare of peatlands, for example, would hold up to four times as much carbon as an equivalent hectare in a tropical rainforest. But again, the perception is that tropical rainforests are the only game in town in terms of carbon emissions. But just to show you sort of on a, on a global basis um, where the, the, you know, the key peatlands actually are, and Indonesia is, is the area where the greatest level of carbon is stored and the greatest level of carbon emissions. But Europe um, follows not, not you know, fairly closely behind. So Europe is really the second area of the planet where um, there, there's significant emissions, carbon emissions from peatlands and significant peatland stocks. And it's mainly Northern Europe that we're talking about. Okay, let's race through the key policies, international policies in terms of peatlands. I can't, uh, because we don't really have enough time to get into them in detail. Uh, firstly, there's the United Nations uh, Convention to Combat Des Desertification. Um, we would have the Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, the Paris Agreement, which everybody really knows about, obviously that's uh, to do with climate change. Um, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are very important particularly clean water, goal number six, responsible consumption, uh, goal number 12, climate action, goal number 13, and life on land, which is perhaps the most important one from the point of view of peatlands, um, number 15. We're just coming into the United Nations uh, decade of ecosystem re restoration, and any, everybody involved in the IUCN will be well familiar with that, but there's a great opportunity in terms of peatlands, really, in terms of the next decade. Um, the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, again, that's really, really important, uh, underpinning um, convention for um, wetlands. And the Global Peatlands Initiative is one that many people will also be familiar with, which it aims to mobilise all sectors to protect peatlands uh, and organic carbon stock. Let's have a look at the key EU policies which affect uh, peatlands. We have the uh, Common Agricultural Policy, which we'll go into in a little bit more detail um, in a minute, the Farm to Fork Strategy, the Water Framework Directive, um, the European Green Deal, which is coming down the line, and the 2030 Framework on Climate Energy, which not many people would think of in relation to peatlands, but it is quite important. And obviously the um, birds and habitats directives are quite crucial in terms of the protection of peatlands. But let's have a quick look at uh, the work we did uh, in the Care Peat Project, um, along with the Wetlands International and Greifswald Meyer Centre principally, um, but many other European organisations uh, from I think about 18 different countries in total, and some of them are represented on this particular slide. Um, the objective of the work we did really was to, to look at um, reducing agricultural greenhouse gas emissions to provide a better deal for farmers um, and just to, to tell people that this could be achieved by re-wetting of peatlands. So we put together a cap position paper, um, we demonstrated uh, where the peatlands are in Europe, um, we also showed where the um, degraded peatland was uh, most pronounced and Germany seems to be the, the worst in terms of uh, peatland emissions. Um, Ireland and the UK certainly have a significant contribution to peatland emissions. So we met many um, interesting people. Um, we, we got support from people like Mairead McGuinness, who is now the Irish um, Commissioner in the European Union, um, and Peter Yar, who's a rapporteur for the Environment Committee. Um, we also got support from Norbert Linz, um, you know, the, the head of the Agricultural Committee, but many different MEPs very much supported our positions. Um, and the key primary goals were um, eligibility of farmed wet peatlands for cap payments. So one of the key points really, and it is a very key point, is that in terms of the Common Agricultural Policy, 
that 25% roughly of agricultural emissions can be reduced by simply focusing on peatlands. And this is quite an enormous amount um, and it's certainly a much easier and more straightforward methodology than many of the, the other proposals in terms of agriculture. I mean, obviously things like culling herds um, you know, of cows and so on, it, it's not exactly something that's very easy to sell to farmers. I don't know that re-wetting peatlands is easy to sell to farmers either, but I, I suspect it's a lot easier than talking about getting rid of all their livestock. Um, so in terms of the, the position paper, we also encouraged polluticulture, and the reason we did that was because um, we felt wetland farming and indeed carbon farming were very, very important um, from the point of view of agriculture, because we do need to make sure that um, agricultural land is uh, actually included, uh, sorry, uh, peatlands are actually included as agricultural land. And this, it appears, has actually been achieved as part of the negotiations in terms of the common agricultural policy. But just to show in terms of the actual uh, protection status on the, the good agricultural environment condition um, number two, which is part of the common agricultural policy, the difficulties that we have faced and still are facing, um, you can see them there. I mean, we're talking about originally talking about uh, the effective protection of wetlands and peatlands. The uh, Commission puts in the word appropriate, then the Parliament puts in the word maintenance of peatlands, which means a lot less. And finally, the Council says minimum protection of peatlands, which is appalling. Uh, and they kick it to touch so far that it's actually beyond the timescale which any of the current MEPs actually exist or most of the governments in Europe actually care about. So literally kicking it to touch, not acceptable. A few words about financial support mechanisms. Obviously government funding and European funding are quite important for um, restoration of peatlands and we're seeing a big example of that happening in Ireland and I know in Scotland and other parts of the UK um, there has been government funding for restoration. But we'd like to see very much blended finance and uh, carbon credits we, we see as for private landowners are actually of huge benefit and we're also looking at, at uh, blue credits and together with the, our Sea Connects project, the Care Peat project is looking into uh, a white paper on uh, carbon and blue credits for the European Commission. So um, other mechanisms that we're looking at uh, would include the, I suppose, polluticulture and uh, carbon farming in general, uh, sphagnum farming. So sphagnum farming is something bespoke, sphagnum farming is something we're trialling as part of the Care Peat project um, together with our partners uh, Lancashire Wildlife Trust and Manchester Metropolitan University in the UK and we'd certainly like to set up similar trials in Ireland in the future. Um, in terms of renewable energy, that's another potential source of revenue. It's something that we're looking at. I know it's a very thorny subject, especially for um, sort of uh, nature protection. Um, windmills co-locating with, with peatlands is a difficult issue as we'll see in a minute with a few examples from Ireland. I wish I could tell you that everything was rosy in the garden in terms of uh, peatland activities in Ireland, but unfortunately there's good news and bad news. Unfortunately, 85% of the losses in the European Union in terms of peatland have taken place in Ireland, and the UK, of course, is now excluded from these figures. There's been environmental destruction in terms of wind farms quite recently in uh, Donegal, for example, and other environmental destruction. We'll see a video about that in a minute. But on the positive side, there's a lot of peatland restoration work uh, being carried out in the country as well. Um, a group of scientists got together recently and put some figures to the government, which uh, thankfully has uh, been listened to. And the government have invested in um, 33,000 hectares of uh, peatland being restored by Board Namona, who were formerly a peatland extraction company. So there's good news and there's bad news um, in Ireland. Recently in Leitrim, we saw this appalling peat slide as a result of uh, excessive rain. It causes enormous environmental damage. This is a, actually quite startling. We're witnessing a, a forest literally travelling down the side of a mountain um, on a bed of peat as a result of a construction work on a wind farm in County Donegal. Uh, this is at Meanbog 
and it really honestly beggars belief i mean shakespeare it comes to mind shakespeare that you know macbeth will be okay until burnham wood shall come to dunsinane well here we have an example of burnham wood slipping down the hill um right on its on its way to dunsinane and it really is uh, appalling environmental destruction and can't be allowed to happen On a much happier note, uh, this is uh, restoration work that we're carrying out as part of the Care Peak project in Ireland on Clon Crowbog in County Westmeath. Um, we're restoring along with the National Parks and Wildlife Service, the Irish Peatland Conservation Council and uh, the Community Wetlands Forum and many other partners um, were restoring the peatland there near Tyrrells Pass and you can see the various dams and so on which have been put in place. Now there is quite a lot of restoration work uh, happening in Ireland at the moment and uh, you'll see an example here of All Saints Bog, an industrial cutaway in count County Offaly. Um, an example nearby of an active raised bog um, which is right beside a former peatland uh, extraction site and you can see quite a, a difference in those but that's the way it is in a lot of parts of Ireland really. Finally, let's have a look at the key policy gaps that uh, Kerpeet has identified as part of its process. In the UK, the top three policy gaps are economic uncertainty, lack of regulatory framework for peatland management, and lack of overall responsibility for peatland management. In terms of barriers, lack of clear signal commitment to change, need for clear demonstration of the benefits and practicalities of alternatives, poor communications and relations. Top three enablers are monetization of carbon and other ecosystem services as well, engagement and building cooperation and demonstrations and early adopters. In Ireland, it's not that different actually. Um, the three top policy gaps are the National Carbon Credits uh, Framework for peatlands, a policy on peatland education and facilitating local landowner rewetting. The top three barriers are lack of financial incentives for peatland rewetting, lack of awareness about benefits from rewetted re peatlands, and lack of awareness and information about alternative income sources from peatlands. Whereas the top three enablers are growing community engagement and leadership, the work of community based organisations, and development of agricultural schemes aimed at rewetting farmland on peatland. I look forward to your questions in a few minutes time and uh, delighted indeed to be taking part in this particular event. Thank you very much. Great, look, thank you very much to uh, our four speakers this afternoon. Just the scale of what, what we do as a peatland community is just, just phenomenal. Um, you know, not just here in, uh, in the UK, but across Europe and, and indeed around the globe. I mean, it's just fantastic to see. And, you know, and I mean, of course, I've been in this game for nearly 30 years now, and it, I, you know, it's just worth going to conferences like this just to remind yourself how important peatlands are, just to remind yourself of, of the scale of that opportunity, how, many, how much land we're talking about, how much carbon it locks up and so on, and just this array of benefits that peatlands give us. It really is the, the, the mother of all ecosystems. So, um, but, it, but then again, you know, we still have a situation where our peatlands are highly damaged. And, and, and there were a few uh, questions coming up around, um, you know, whether we can, whether we've really communicated the benefits to people. And that, so that's a general question. Um, Faisal, can you start? Well, how, how do we improve our narrative? How do we demonstrate these benefits that peatlands give us um, to, to make it even more even even more chance for that 50% of damaged peatlands to be restored over the next, say, 50 years? I think it's been, uh, it's quite a challenge to get across the right message about peatlands, because peatlands, I think, uh, have been given a bad rap in the past, and there's a lot of uh, misinformation has been given. But I think that we're seeing, uh, for example, the experience in Southeast Asia, there is really great recognition now of the impact when you degrade and destroy peatlands. We've had more than 50 million people affected by the clouds of smoke and haze from burning peat fires. So it's a, it's a negative uh, factor, but now I think everyone across the region is sensitized to the negative impact of degradation of peat. 
Then the debate on climate change, I think, has brought out the great significance, what we have to do to uh, keep the, the carbon in the soil, on the land, and out of the atmosphere. And I think that uh, carbon significance is building into national and local uh, programs and plans across the world. And I think that's one of the key messages. But it's also important to get to the real the benefit of the common people. What is it? How will peatland benefit them? So is it water supply? Is it avoiding the, the haze or air pollution? Are there other benefits, recreation or education or others? We really have to look at something that appeals to that particular target group that we're after trying to influence about the importance of peatland systems. Neil, does that chime with you? Because, you know, uh, as a politician and, and as a researcher, <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I thought your common agricultural policy example was really um, instructive, really, you know, that you know, these massive benefits, we know that the cap and the common agricultural policy across the EU has been, you know, pretty disastrous in for the natural environment. Um, it could be it could be reformed into something so much better and peatland seems an obvious place to start it's a small amount of land area which has massive benefits and yet and yet we see the issue being kicked to touch or the can being kicked down the road mm. what, what should, how, how do we get politicians across europe to start you know seeing these benefits and actually changing things like the cap well i i think the key way is to, to talk to them you know i know that sounds a bit of a, a bit of a sort of trite thing to say but quite often you know and I, I introduced a number of Irish academics brought them around the um, Irish Parliament and they're all peatland experts they'd never been around the Irish Parliament they didn't even know you could do it and just talking to the various different spokespeople and you know that that, that helped to lead to quite significant changes actually um, you know the, there was a lot of uh, policy changing and, and politicians are only too delighted to um, talk to people generally and you see, one of the things I, I find, I find you get these committees like the Envy Committee and the Agri Committee. So, you know, there, there's a conflict between those two committees. You have a different type of politician on both of those particular um, groups. So quite often they're, they're in conflict with each other. I know there's a certain level of crossover, but there's, um, you know, there's quite often a, a bit of a silo approach and you've got two different um, two different commissions. It's the same in, in every parliament. I mean, you've got different departments. And the thing is, they don't often talk to each other. So really getting getting to discourse and talking talking to the people who don't just agree with you. It's all very well us, us wonderful people sitting here today talking to each other and agreeing with each other. Yes, I, I'll probably agree with everybody here um, about how important peatlands are. But there's lots of people out there who say, well, look, hang on, I, I, I have to drain my peatlands because it's the only way I can make a living. I'm a farmer and, you know, if, if I don't drain my peatlands, I I'm, I'm, can't feed my family, you know, and we kind of need to come up with solutions. We have to talk to the people. We have to find ways past that. So the only way is, is by talking to people who are not totally convinced about um, the, the incredible importance of peatlands. And, and really, it's not a case of we should just talk to the people who we agree with. It's a case of finding solutions with the people who we don't agree with. And that's kind of my take on it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Hans, just to bring you in on that, that point, I mean, there was a question asked by Rosie Snowden from the Pennine Peak Project. And, you know, she said, you know, persuade, how do we persuade landowners of these multiple benefits? Because, you know, on the Pennine Blanket Box, for example, you know, the, the, the dom one of the dominant land uses is, is burning peatlands and draining peatlands to, to increase the numbers of red grouse. That's their focus. Um, you know, we want to, to persuade those people that, you know, make a living out of, red, out of shooting red, red grouse. Um, how do we persuade them to, or, or indeed any other community around peatland areas, how do we persuade them that actually a wet bog is better? It's quite an interesting point that you touch on there, Rob, as um, I think the talking and listening and making sure that the local community sees a real benefit for them as well is absolutely essential. To long-term success of these restoration projects. <clears throat> if you learn, when you listen to my to my talk earlier on, and you see the work that we do, we've done in Indonesia, whereby we've embedded and we've recreated and worked together with local communities to come up with sustainable business models that work for them. And whether or not that is sagu grown on um, peat with very high water tables, or whether it is the puro and grass, we we marry the profitable and um, prosperous local communities with, a, with a, the right looking after the peatlands. 
And I think that works because you go to the local community and you ask them what is going on. And I think one of the other points that we haven't raised yet here in, in this discussion is disaster risk reduction. So I think that's absolutely essential as well. Um, we can see it from the point of fires, whereby the risk to society is really big and therefore society should invest in reducing that risk from dried out peat and fires. But even in, in Indonesia and further afield as well, whereby the the, um, the, the, the collapse of the peat itself and therefore the increased risk of flooding to local communities and therefore their, their long-term sustainability is really important. But bringing that to home, when you talk about the Pennines, I think there are <clears throat> really good opportunities to, to, to blend and to create a win-win between and carbon sequestration and a healthy recreation there. Because in the end of the day, the grouse shooting and the shooting brings in significant revenues to these, these rural communities. And that is possible, but we don't need to burn. I think there are other opportunities there. And I think we need to think outside the box in can we manage the vegetation in a way which doesn't involve drainage and we do, which doesn't involve, um, or, you know, doesn't involve drainage and which doesn't involve burning, but still creates the right habitat for grouse or for a, a species which creates the right um, 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 business environment for, uh, for for recreational shooting. And I think that is possible. We just need to think outside that box. And I think we need to open up the creative thinking of the local communities and say, what can we do there? And go there and talk to the crofters and talk to the landowners and say, how can we move forward to get together? If you think about that, for example, and I don't want to take too much time, um, take for example, the the, the, the milk supply chain going into um, milk factories in the west of Scotland, in the southwest of Scotland, whereby the, the business risk and the business cost associated with a fluctuating quality and quantity of milk is really creating a problem by creating a better management of the, of the wetlands and the peatlands you get a much more sustainable and steady supply in terms of quality and quantity, less flooding, better quality and better quantities. That reduces the business expenditure and therefore the, the, um, the, uh, the business can put, put a higher price on that milk because they got a greater, um, a greater um, 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 continuity. So there are those sweet spots, those win-wins, but they are quite local. And we need to think then in about the functioning of the landscape and think about how can we work together with these communities to identify those sweet spots. But that's a very Faisal. long answer, but it is yeah, very it's, possible, uh, I think. No, absolutely. Faisal, I just want to bring you back in. Um, it's amazing what's happened in Southeast Asia, and you know, all credit to you, of course. But, um, you know, that, that switch from, you know, the massive degradation that went on in the 90s and, and the early 2000s to what seems to be a restorative picture, you know, so first off, is, is that real? You know, have, have we turned the corner in Southeast Asia from, from um, damage to restoration? And, and are there any lessons for us over on the other end of the Eurasian continent in the windswept, snow-covered parts of Europe? Yeah, I, I think as I presented a bit in the presentation, there has been a total fundamental switch. If we compare 20, 30 years ago, it was, you know, Peatland are the frontier, that's the place to grab land, that's the area to expand. Everyone going to become billionaires by developing oil palm to a situation now where the oil palm industry itself says, no more. We have recognized, we have created so much problem for ourselves by rapidly expanding into these fragile ecosystems. And although we've made some money, we have lost uh, billions and the impact has been massive. And that is where the that's been very important. I think what Neil said, you need to talk to people. 15 years ago, we started the process, RSPO, Roundtable of Sustainable Palm Oil, where we brought all the stakeholders together, NGOs, bankers, retailers from Europe, the, the growers, the oil palm industry, and others, and had a dialogue. And it was very difficult at the beginning, but now one shifted over 10 years of dialogue and working together and recognition that they, totally changed their view and recognition and went from fighting against the environmentalists to working with the environmentalists and recognizing we're all on the same side, we need sustainability, and that really changed the sector. And then as that sector started to change, you also saw government policy change. Government policy was driven by the massive fires, the incredible economic loss. Just the fire recently in 2015 in Indonesia, 
estimating 15, 20 billion dollars loss from that fire. And what's the gain from a little bit of easier land clearing for a few companies or some villages? So massive loss. The estimate from uh, Harvard, uh, 100,000 people, additional people died during that. So we're talking about massive environment, social, economic cost. And the government basically saying enough is enough. We've got to stop this and change course. And I think the government, I mean, in any country, there's a lot of lobbying and so on. But in some cases, we had segment of the industry that we'd already convinced, oil palm sector, that backed up the government story. When this government said no more permits for peat. And then incredibly, Indonesia, what's happening is a transformation to shift out, to reverse that to designate all of the deep peat areas, uh, the intact peat areas as conservation, and to phase out at the end of the, the current uh, planting cycle of 20 years to phase out all of these plantations. That is incredibly strong. And that was economic assessment because they realized that these development in the peatland area was generating maybe 0.5% of GDP, and it was generating 70% of the greenhouse gas emissions and it was leading to multi-billion of losses. And when you project in the subsidence, we're seeing that vast portion of these developed peatland are going to be dropping down to the sea level or below, I mean, and then they're going to be flooded and useless, abandoned and burning. And I think, I think bringing those very core economic stories to the government was able to get that, that change. And I, I really think if we can do it in Indonesia, and we can do it in Malaysia, you better be able to do it in the UK and in Europe. I mean, get, get out there, get on with it. You can do it. I mean, it was relatively small group in Southeast Asia, but we were able to do it by persistence and working with broad range of stakeholders and getting everyone to work together towards a common goal. Not everything is solved. There's still challenges, but we have made a major change. Okay, and Francisca, you know, so just to try and translate that across to Europe, you know, I know that close to where you live, there are peatlands that are drained and, um, and, and actually just moan for, um, for common agricultural policy subsidies. So we're a long way from that uh, change. I mean, what is the picture in Europe? Have, have we moved from degradation to restoration or are we still in the sort of degradative mode and, we're, and we, need to, we really need to buck our, uh, our act up and get up, up, up to the sorts of levels that we're seeing in Southeast Asia? Yeah, we are moving, I think, and I see it. I can see it here uh, around uh, the place where I live in, in Greifswald, but uh, we are moving too slowly. So we need to mobilize uh, partners uh, in all different spheres of our society, of economy. So I can only uh, support what also the previous speakers already said. We need, I mean, we have the Cinderella syndrome. People, peatlands are uh, overlooked. Um, and it's really often, I mean, just showing pictures to people. It's not, a peatland is not something nice like what you have in your background. So I, I should have something in my background with a cow, cow standing on it, just the degraded peatlands, because this mm -hmm. is how our peatlands normally look like uh, nowadays. And uh, we need to talk about it. We need to uh, find more comparisons, uh, like, for example, the CO2 footprint of a liter of milk from a drained uh, peatland used as a grassland um, is double the amount of a liter of petrol. So people do not know about it. They're just buying the milk and uh, because you also don't see it with the product. So we need to talk more about the carbon footprint of uh, products from peatlands, from drain peatlands. Um, we also need to think about insetting opportunities that products from wet peatlands, from paludi culture are not, I mean, it's difficult to compete with the, uh, in the market, but we need to, to uh, bring in uh, the benefits we have, um, the other ecosystem services. And um, with regard to farmers, I think in the past, it was often, felt by the farmers that it's rather accusing them of doing something wrong. So what we are now also more trying to say is, I mean, uh, they, for many farmers, it's also more a problem than a, than a benefit that they have the peat soil. So they need support of the society because it was also a societal decision in the past, at least in my region, that the peatlands were drained. So now we need a societal decision that we want to rebet them and we need to support the farmers rather than just uh, pushing them out um, and, and not offering them anything. And for the politicians, clearly, it's it's about talking. I'm very uh, happy that we have people like Neil, for example, now in the in the peatland uh, conservation community, uh, knowing the business, and um, that is uh, really uh, something that can make a difference. Great, thanks, Franz. And, and we've seen 
carry on, Francisco. We've seen the importance of some of these um, international agreements, you know, whether they're at a sort of a regional level, like the Southeast Asian ag uh, agreements that has made such a big difference there. We've seen the importance of the, of the nature directives in the EU. Um, we, we've seen the, the perversity of the common agricultural policy, which is another, you know, uh, international agreement in effect. Um, but we've got one big one coming up, of course, which is COP26, the Climate Change Convention in Glasgow in just, just uh, next year. So um, and that's quite an exciting moment. You know, if, if you had a little crystal ball and you could, you could, you could make things happen at COP, well, what would you want, Francisca, for the for European peoples? Yeah, I remember the, the last COP in, in Katowice and um, it was like, um, I was really stunned that there were, I mean, tens of thousands of people walking around discussing climate policies. And I, I thought that maybe it's like, 20 or 30 people really knowing about peatlands uh, there. There's a lot of, uh, a big crowd of people, I mean, uh, dealing with forests and they're still, it's very unbalanced still. So I would also like to encourage more people to get involved. It's not so difficult. You can uh, find your partners uh, as NGOs, you can uh, get registered, you can go there for side events, you can talk about the case, you can present success stories with regard to, to climate change mitigation and peatlands. Um, and uh, I would really hope that, I mean, generally the there is a big move forward. We now have a bit of momentum with uh, the elections in the uh, United States, with China and Japan, uh, Japan announcing their own ambitions. Uh, and then that, that more countries than now really take up uh, peatlands in their nationally determined contributions in their NDCs and that they, are, that they know what they are doing um, and that they really show ambition with regard to peat soils. Because I, I strongly believe it's a big opportunity. Great, thanks, thanks, Francis. So there's a there's a call to us all. So we've uh, we've all got to book our holidays in Scotland next year. Beautiful country, what a great place to visit, and really really show the, the decision makers at COP26 that peatlands are important. Very quickly, as we as we kind of fi finish up this session, Hans, a very quick word from you. What's your dreams for COP26? Oh, I think it's very clear the Scottish government is very driven for big peatland restoration. Put 250 million in over the next 10 years. I want that to be really visible. I want it to be plastered all over it, that peatlands are, the, are a big part of that solution. So I think it needs to be upfront and then we will be do our, our best as Wetlands International and the, you know, the links that I have from the back to actually make that happen. And Neil, do you see a, do you see a link between COP26 and perhaps things like reform of the common agriculture policy, which is so damaging to European peatlands? There should be. And I, I, my, my own dream really for the whole thing, I suppose, is that land use, I, I think land use is hugely important. And I think, you know, when, when politicians talk about quick wins, I think many of them don't understand how to get the quick wins. And really peatlands, you know, from my point of view, is potentially a quick win. And what I would like to see from, from that particular, um, you know, that particular event is that it, it's recognized and that basically peatlands huge investment on a worldwide scale happens because i think it is something that if we if we take it on really at a global scale literally people talking about it in the streets you know it's something that could happen very very quickly if we had a mind to so that's what i'd like to see i'd like to see um you know prioritization of things that can actually work and i certainly think peatland restoration is one of them Great, thanks, Neil. Faisal, do you want to wrap this up? How just how important are these international agreements to um, to to solving global environmental problems like peatland degradation? I think it's fundamental that we rarely get peat recognised in the framework, decision making, and momentum under COP26 and the Climate Change Convention. I mean, we have seen here in uh, Southeast Asia where we have been able to get key policy decision built into government framework, you can transform what is happening in the region. And I think peatlands is so globally significant. And I think if there's ever going to be a COP in a place where you can influence everyone to talk about peat, that's going to be COP26 in the biggest, one of the biggest peatland areas in, in the whole of Europe. And maybe we should be looking, we've got one year to go. Maybe we need a coalition of peatland countries in the past at COP in Bali in Indonesia, there was a coalition of rainforest countries that came together and made totally transformative decisions in the COP relating to red blasts and getting forests into the thing. We need to get the coalition of peatland countries, Indonesia, Canada, Russia, US now, US coming in, US number four in the world in peat, but they have no clue in their climate policy about reducing emissions from 
organic soil because it's buried in the agriculture uh, ministry uh, department uh, information. So I think if we can look at a strategy where we take the 10 or 15 top countries and try to mobilize civil society, other groups, government leaders to do something. Indonesia is rarely want to help spearhead something. We've got Global Peat Initiative. I mean, attending this meeting, Diana was talking just before this. We can get that coalition coming together, but also sometimes small, simple thing can make a great difference. One of the key references we had when we started the whole project to restore the abandoned million hectare rice scheme in Indonesia was a certain little publication of case studies from Europe, something called Bog Conserving Bogs, the handbook edited by a certain Rob Stoneman. And this was the key document that we took out some diagrams and drawings and we turned it into something which we presented to the local and national government. And we come up with a plan to block this abandoned irrigation canal which were 50 kilometers long, 30 meters wide and 10 meters deep. But we, we took out some pictures from your book, blew up the scale a bit, and then we made those demonstration block. And that led to the policy change and a presidential uh, decree to follow that model. So I think if we can just take small examples, we've got hundreds of examples, showcase them and getting groups coming forward in Glasgow and, and putting that and putting together events and showcasing and let's get the government facilitating that showcasing of experience and images from around the world. Then I think small things can lead to big changes and to show it can be done and it can be done by everyone. Everyone can contribute. It's not only billions you need, small can together make the difference and can transform. Great, thank you Faisal. Well, that's a great message of hope to, um, to finish on and we've, we've got a work cut out. We've got a year to go to COP26. I think there's a plan forming now, Faisal's just laid it all out so let's uh, let's get on and do that that's really exciting a great output of this of this session um i just want to thank our our four speakers that's been great what a great whiz through through global peatland initiatives um just just fantastic to see this stuff happening um you know we we can do this it's really exciting so let's let's get on and do it and thank you to all the people listening to this in the conference we are the peatland community let's keep us let's keep together let's keep working at a UK, at a European, at a global level, because together we are surely better than we are individually. And, uh, and just to remind you that this uh, meeting carries on tomorrow. Uh, we'll be meeting again, I think at 9.40. So I look forward to seeing you virtually all tomorrow. It's a shame we can't have a beer together tonight, but um, <laughs> just have one and pretend. All right, thank you very much, goodbye. Well done. <laughs>